maybe you are part of a local artist association. And I know a lot of artist associations, oftentimes they have an annual member show or sometimes they have a juried exhibition. So those are really important exhibition opportunities that I know a lot of artists really look forward to. And so when you're not able to do that, oh my God, it's such a bummer. And I know for everybody across the board, it's a big bummer. So hopefully we can find some solution that somewhat starts to acknowledge the same needs. Maybe you're a teacher and you have an end of the year student show for your seniors, for a particular class that you're teaching. And I know a lot of teachers, what's challenging about this is oftentimes they're asked to do this with little or no budget. So this is very tricky because you have to figure out a way to do it without a lot of resources at your fingertips. Or maybe, and this is the biggest bummer of all, I know there are a lot of artists who had exhibitions that were already scheduled, ready to go, and then were abruptly shut down because of the pandemic. And so some people, it was just canceled, which is really heartbreaking and other people have their shows postponed. So let's say maybe they're going to happen next summer. But I think when you know you're going to have an exhibition, you get into this particular mindset. And I think for some people, sometimes having an online show can satisfy those needs temporarily until you actually are able to have that brick and mortar situation. So there are so many options right now because people are trying to fulfill this need of having an online show. And if you look up online art exhibition, there's all these different options. For example, there are sites like this one where you actually pay multiple fees and then you can use their templates and create a show like that. But I think a lot of artists probably don't have the budget to do that. And a lot of these programs aren't really cheap. So I think for a lot of people, it's not really a viable option. And I know that a lot of museums are creating these virtual tours, which are fantastic. I mean, here's one that you see from the Frick Collection in New York City, and they really are these virtual reality experiences where you can click through, you can pivot and change the angle and everything, and that's super cool, okay? But again, <laughs> your average artist who's having a juried member show with the Artists Association, you're not going to be able to afford the technology that is necessary to do this. So this really comes down to the root of a question that I think is fundamental to consider if you want to make an online show. And tell me in the chat the answer to this question for you, from your point of view. Why do you think we exhibit artwork? Why do we do that? Okay, because oftentimes... We're mostly in the studio, we're producing the work, it's very hands-on, usually very messy. So why do we go through the trouble to find a gallery space, to hang up the artwork, to have an open reception? What are the reasons why as artists we want to do that? Because a lot of people do do that. People do it to different degrees. Some people exhibit all the time. Some people have never exhibited but are thinking about it. So tell me in the chat, why do you think it's important as an artist to exhibit your artwork, in theory, in a brick and mortar situation. Why would that be important? I really think what it comes down to, and there are a lot of other reasons too, but the one that I think is the most compelling is that artists want their work to be seen. They want their work to be acknowledged. It's sort of like that tree in the forest metaphor if a tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it, does it make a sound? And I think being an artist is sort of the same way. Like if I spend all this time working so hard in this painting, but nobody really gets to see it, it can sometimes feel like this fruitless effort for a lot of artists. And so I really think the exhibition, it's there so you can feel seen, so people can acknowledge and celebrate the work that you've done. And I think it does for a lot of artists, it makes you feel like it's a milestone, that somehow you have hit some particular goal that you had in mind, and it's a really good experience for everybody. Now, you don't have to exhibit all the time. I'm, I haven't been in a show <laughs> for a really long time, which is a little bit embarrassing because I'm supposed to. But anyway, I think that there are a whole host of reasons, but I think ultimately people just wanna be seen. So let's see what you guys are saying in the comments. 
Auntie M saying, I want to exhibit because I want my peers to see it. Yeah, a lot of this is not just that you want people to see it, but that you want your friends, you want your family, you want them to see what you've been up to in a formal setting that feels a little bit more legitimate than like stumbling into your <laughs> really crazy studio space and stuff like that. Richard is saying to gain exposure and make sales. Absolutely. So if you have a gallery show, there usually is the possibility and potential of having work be sold through the gallery show and also to get your stuff out there. Because the thing is, if you make your work in your studio, you don't put it out there. Nobody knows that you exist. And so once you're in a gallery space, say in a jury show with all these other people, it's like you get to consolidate all these different artists, people who see the show get to see your stuff. And it oftentimes does lead to sales. So exposure and sales. And I really like this one from Carrie who says to share the vision. This is such a nice comment because I think ultimately artists are part of communities and such a big part of a community is really just sharing with each other, seeing what other people are doing. And it's really a wonderful experience. Like Fievel is saying art is made to be seen. Jade Leaf is saying, I think some artists want people to see the world through their eyes and through their mind. Yeah, so that goes back to what Carrie was saying about really sharing your experience with somebody else. And Blue Will Spirit says, this is a question, how many pieces that are looked at are, quote, seen versus the people at the exhibition being seen? Well, this is very true. I mean, the whole joke about opening receptions is that you don't really see any artwork when you go to an opening. You're really there to chat and talk to people. And so oftentimes, if I have a friend that has a show, usually I'll try to go at another time when I, I really can look at the work. Because usually at an opening reception, it's really, really difficult. Okay, so artists want to be seen and acknowledged. So here's the thing, you guys. If that is ultimately the goal of an exhibition, why do we need to try to make these virtual exhibitions where there's a photo of a gallery and you paste in your painting into that photo of the gallery? I'm really not convinced that seeing a photo of an artwork in a gallery makes people seen. I think it's like a direct translation that people are trying to achieve. And I'm seeing the same thing with remote teaching that a lot of people want a direct translation. Well, I did it this way in person. I have to find a way to replicate that exact situation. But the thing is, when you translate something from in-person to online, it's not a direct translation. I mean, if you think about if you wanna translate something from Russian into French, stuff gets lost in translation. All of a sudden it's not the same thing anymore. So I almost think that you're gonna be banging your head against the wall if you really want to make it look like a brick and mortar situation. I don't think it has to be that way. So think about it not as a direct translation, but rather this is an initiative online for people to have their artwork seen, to be acknowledged, to get exposure, maybe lead to sales. And as long as you accomplish those goals, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter what the delivery is. You're looking after the goal. People are so focused on the delivery, like it has to look this way. And I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter as long as you achieve the goals. So I think about it like that. Cricket Whisperer says, I have a friend who turned her home into a gallery. She did this interactive gallery view. You can scroll around and it's basically AR and VR or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's really cool. But I think one of the things, especially for teachers, a lot of them, don't have the technology or don't know the technology. And honestly, I mean, teachers are so strapped for time right now that it's really difficult to do. I think that's what's really tricky. Fievel says, but as someone who goes to museums and art exhibits, I want to experience art. It's different to see it as a photograph. Oh, absolutely. I mean, nobody is gonna deny that it's a different experience. It's just that we have to acknowledge, okay, we are not gonna have that experience, okay? Instead, we're not gonna replicate the experience. We're gonna try to translate it into a form that makes more sense online. Like Cricket Whisperer saying, I just go to galleries to be inspired and see other people's point of view. And you can do that in a photograph, okay? It's not the same as in person, nothing ever will be, but you can still gain something 
from seeing somebody's artwork online. Yeah, like Blue Will Spirit is saying, it really doesn't need to be wrapped in a gallery setting for the art to be viewed. In fact, like if you look at a photo of a gallery, you actually get a very compromised view of the artwork because usually it's distorted and usually the artwork is small. Like usually in the photograph, people try to capture the whole gallery space. And so consequently, the artwork gets really small and a little bit hard to see. Okay, so what I'm thinking you guys, don't try to just replicate the brick and mortar gallery. Instead, try to translate the exhibition into online language. And so that got me thinking, okay, well, what is the language of being online and how can we really maximize this? So what I would say, it's not so much that I'm telling people how to recreate an art exhibition. That's not really what I'm telling people to do. What I'm telling people is look, because you can't do that, do this instead. So it's almost like you guys were like, oh, I really want apples. And I'm like, guess what? We don't have any apples. Here's an orange. <laughs> Sorry, it's just not the same thing. I know it's not as crunchy. It's not from the orchard, but it's another version of something else. That's one way to think about it. Okay, so one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that I was a gallery director for four years when I was on the faculty at Wellesley College. And so I ran the Jewett Gallery, which was mostly a student gallery, although we did occasionally have a couple of professional artists who had exhibitions there. And so I have a lot of experience organizing, managing, mounting all types of shows. We did solo shows, we did shows with 50 people in them. So I definitely know what's out there and how to organize this. So the thing about being a gallery manager is first of all, I really feel like when you work in a gallery, it's, real, it's invisible work. Because the thing is, if you do a good job as a gallery director, nobody really notices anything. You're just like, oh yeah, the show looks great. <laughs> you know. But if you mess up and you do like a really bad job, something at the gallery is gonna look terrible. Like it's, it's if you do it well, nobody notices, but if you do a terrible job, everybody notices. So it's a really different type of thing. So I really feel that I have learned about what are the things that really make a show and what would be online the most critical to really be emphasizing. Karen has a really good point. They're saying the artworks are clubbed together a certain way, which is different from seeing everything someone made on Instagram. Absolutely, because when you mount a physical show, you do have to think about placement and you do have to think about the dynamics of the individual pieces and what do they look like together. So yeah, I mean, there's so many things that I know are so much better in person, but it's like, we can't, we just can't mourn the loss of that because that's what's happening right now with remote teaching. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of teachers are so frustrated because it's like, you you feel like you're in mourning almost like you're mourning the job that you used to have and i think the same thing can happen with art exhibitions that you're mourning the loss of that in-person experience okay and that stinks it's just the worst thing but the thing is i don't want to do that forever and ever i want to move on and do something something is better than nothing in my opinion because just if you just cancel everything it's such a bummer you have to put something in there Re says, if you do a good job, nobody notices. If you do a bad job, everyone notices. That's every job. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> it's not isolated to gallery director work. I mean, that is the case for a lot of jobs out there, for sure. So I sort of asked myself, okay, if we can't do brick and mortar, what would a show I couldn't attend in person look like on Instagram? Because that happens all the time. A lot of the times I have friends who have exhibitions and they're in California or something and I'm not able to attend, but I still want the experience. I still want to celebrate their artwork and I wanna see what they're doing. And so in that sense, people have sort of gone to virtual exhibitions in the past. We just haven't thought about it that way because the online version accompanied the brick and mortar and really was a supplement. It was not the main thing. So now you have to flip and say, okay, the online thing is the main thing. Now we have to make that make a bigger splash. Okay. 
so here's the thing, like Lauren Welch, who is one of the teaching artists here at Art Prof, she's had so many shows. I mean, her like, her exhibition history is like on fire right now, which I'm like so super stoked for her. But the thing is, I really have not been able to see any of her shows in person because she's had them in New Hampshire and New York City, but because she's fabulous and I love her work, I want to see her stuff, okay? So really for me, the only way I can ever experience right now at least, or even before, I mean, before the pandemic, I still couldn't go to her shows, okay? The only way I was able to celebrate these moments with her was through Instagram. That was the only way, okay? Because what, was she going to text me images? Was she going to eat? No, she's going to put them on Instagram because that's the easiest way for everybody to have access. And so when I see a photo like this or the one that we just saw, that makes me feel that I am part of that experience. It's not as good if I took a plane to California and saw it in person, nothing will ever substitute that. I don't really have the money for that. and <laughs> I can't just shoot off to see somebody's show. And so when I see a picture like this and it's Lauren with her work, and she's wearing her fabulous green outfit for the opening, I do feel to a certain degree that I am part of the experience, okay? That is really important. Yeah, like Blueville Spirit is saying, I like the positive message of moving forward with something else rather than pouting that you don't have what you want. I know, I mean, wouldn't we all love <laughs> for life to go back to normal before the pandemic? But you know what I'm really pushing people to do, especially teachers, is to find long-term solutions. Because I think a lot of people, obviously when the pandemic happened and everything shut down, it was so abrupt and it was really shocking for a lot of people. So we all sort of threw band-aids on things because what else are you gonna do? That was the only option. But the thing is now, I think what a lot of people and myself are starting to realize is that, wow, this is not a band-aid situation. This is like, we need long-term solutions so we don't go crazy. I mean, if I sit around mourning the loss of all these experiences, I'm just gonna be depressed all the time. So that's what's really tricky. So this is a show that Lauren just had in New York City. It's in a Chelsea gallery, Winston Watcher Fine Art Gallery. This is a big deal for her, okay? This is like, she's on the map now. <laughs> so I'm like so proud of her, okay? And so you can see, this is the show. I think they were able to open the gallery. And so a couple of people, you know, with social distancing and everything, they were all able to go, but it's like, I got to see this and she writes in the caption stuff that she talks about. So in the caption, she says, here are some conversations I really enjoyed during the show. So somebody said the palm pattern with this bird pattern, the shape with the, I don't know, I can't read that, it's too small. But <laughs> the point is she shared moments with me. She told me what happened at the show. There's a picture of her and I do feel satisfied in that sense. I will never be as satisfied as if I say it in person, but it's just not practical, okay? And let's see these other comments. So Fival is saying, online exhibitions give those who have no means to travel, even without COVID, the opportunity to see art by international artists. It extends my horizons, for sure. I mean, let's say you have a friend in Austria. They're not gonna come, there's just no way. And so I actually think you guys, despite feeling like this is a short-term thing that, okay, it's not going to go on forever and ever, it sort of can in terms of online shows because if the pandemic is over, your friend still lives in Australia or wherever, you still are going to need to know how to share that experience of the online exhibition with your friend. So this actually, this is not a skill that is isolated to the pandemic. It is definitely a skill that can go beyond that because you know what? There will always be people who can't come to your show. That's just a fact of life. So it's really important. Karen is saying it's important to try and create some feeling of closeness, both at an exhibition, but certainly also in a teaching setting. Yeah, it's like you really need things, I think, to feel personal. And so let's talk about exactly how to make that happen. And so really you guys, the language of being online, it's social media, that's really what it is. That's where people hang out, okay? I mean, I know for a long time, I used to obsess over my website and stuff like that. Honestly, <laughs> I probably update my website like twice a year. It's really not that often. Social media, I'm on it several times a day. I mean, because of art prof and all this other stuff, but it really is where people hang out. I mean, if you guys just think about 
the amount of time you spend on social media versus the amount of time you spend on custom artist websites, there's no chance that an artist website is going to trump the amount of time you spend on Instagram. I think, I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that is the case. So what I'm going to recommend to people, if you are doing an online show, don't build the show on a website. Like, let's say you are part of Old Town Artists Association and you guys have a website for your group. And that's great. You know, you should have a website for sure. But the thing is, you guys, if you're having a show and let's say the online show is going to be one or two months long, guys, it's a lot of work <laughs> to build a customized page of an exhibition. Because here's the thing. I do both. OK, I post stuff on Instagram for ArtProf. We also have ArtProf.org. And I'm always building and adding things into the website. But you know what? The amount of time it takes for me to format and design and lay out a page on artprof.org compared to uploading it to Instagram, the website is like three times the amount of work. So in my opinion, not only would a customized website take way longer, but I just am not convinced it would get remotely the amount of traffic that it would get on Instagram. And so it takes longer and your visibility is lower. So it's like, why would you go about doing that? And you know, a lot of these places like teachers and artist associations, you guys don't have webmasters. You can't hire like a web developer to do this for you because it's too expensive. So you have to find the way that is the most efficient that's gonna get the highest amount of visibility and exposure for everybody. Tiago is saying, great tips. I'll be in a collective exhibition next month with my sculptures. That's really exciting. Wonderful. And Lunaire is saying, I guess a lot of artists really need to work on their photography and filming skills. Now it's even more important to be able to properly capture their work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you guys have heard me say before that artists live and die by their photographs. And so we do have a stream that's about how to photograph artwork. I highly recommend you guys take a look at that. So in my opinion, especially if you're strapped for cash and time, which most people are, consolidate your efforts in an online show on Instagram. It is the biggest bang for your buck because remember, you want to be seen, you want exposure, you want to be acknowledged, not just by the general public, but by your friends and your family. Where are your friends and family? They're hanging out on social media because they already follow you. They're not going to go probably to artprof.org to experience that show. And if they do, they're going to look at it for two minutes and that'll be it. Okay. And the thing is, the nice thing about social media is that it's an ongoing experience because you can post every day or every other day. A lot of people, a website is like a one-time thing. It's like you go there, you look at it, you leave. You don't usually feel a reason to continually check and see the updates because most websites are not updated every single day. So in my opinion, those customized websites, they're just so much work. That's really not necessary. Like Blue Will Spirit is saying, Instagram has, quote, built-in traffic flows. Yeah, it's like your friends and families are already following you. So they don't have to, like, get up and move somewhere else to see their show. They're already in there. And then Blue Will Spirit also says, webmasters are just to create the site. SEO people drive traffic to the site. And, oh, my God, SEO, that is not something you're not going to, like, shoot up in search in a month, I mean, maybe at the New York Times or what about you, but other than that, your average artist association is really not going to have that experience. So Instagram is much better. Okay, so I thought to myself, what exactly are the components of a gallery show? Brick and mortar. Okay, so this is coming from my own experience as a gallery director. Okay, usually every artist has an artist statement. And generally speaking, there's like a binder that's sitting at the gallery desk. And usually every artist has their CV, they have their statement, maybe there's some other publicity stuff. And so that usually sits there. And so oftentimes, the artist statements are not always seen. Sometimes they just sit there and people don't actually get to see them very much. Art on the wall, duh, <laughs> of course, you're gonna have that for sure. Artwork info. So usually in a gallery, you'll have like a little clear label. It will say the name, the title, the size, the date. So that way everybody can see the individual information for each piece. Sometimes it's a juror, like a lot of artist associations, oftentimes they will invite a juror to come and look at all these submissions and they pick the pieces. And so that's actually a pretty important component because oftentimes 
the juror sometimes is who attracts certain artists to submit. So that's definitely a component. Auntie M is saying, what are the best tags for an online art exhibition? Well, I mean, you can definitely start with online art exhibition. And I think what I would also think about too is like the community you're in. So let's say you live in Slumbersville, California, okay? I don't know if that's real, probably is not. You probably want to tag Slumbersville because you know that that's the community where your gallery normally would be. So I would say keep it fairly local. So that way it's like your surrounding community and those types of people are more likely to see it. Reception food. This is such a big thing. <laughs> like You guys tell me, <laughs> tell me in the chat, which type of gallery goer are you? Are, are you one of those people who just like feasts <laughs> on the reception food? Do you like graze at the reception or are you just oh, so cool that you're sipping on your wine and you're not eating anything? Because you know, what's really funny is I once had this guy who helped me with the exhibitions doing all this work and everything and he'd always come like before the opening reception started and this guy like no shame like he would just like gorge on the brie he just kept i was like wow really you don't think anybody's looking <laughs> and then there was this other student when i was an art school student at RISD. so there would be a student show like every week every single friday something would show people would have um, food and everything. There was this one student, he would only go to eat the food. Like he never <laughs> did anything else. I was like, could you please just like try a little bit? And so I think the reception food is actually sort of a big deal because it's sort of how you get people to come. There's all kinds of things you can offer. And you know, what's funny is I totally like remember like who had good reception food. <laughs> it's so shallow. I know, but I'm always like, oh yeah, that show had good food. Or sometimes you go, you're like, eh, there's nothing here. So yeah, tell me <laughs> what's going on with reception food. Like Darwin is saying, if the gallery reception has no food, I feel so much more awkward. Yeah, exactly. You guys ever go to a show where there's just bottled water and you're like, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> now, Plague on Humanity says, I'm definitely a grazer kind of person. I really don't eat at opening receptions. It's kind of weird because I'm such a foodie and I love eating. I guess because most of the time when I go to an exhibition, I need to see certain people, I need to talk to the artist. And so for me, it's really a professional networking type of thing. And I just feel like, I don't know, like once I start eating, I get to relax and I can focus. So I don't usually do that. But yeah, like, look at this 10,000 crows, ooh, reception food. See, that's always what people get really excited about. So yeah, okay, guest book. This is sort of an old fashioned thing, but I'll tell you guys, I love the guest book. It's so intimate. And what I really enjoy about it, actually nowadays especially, seeing people's handwriting is really nice. I mean, so much of the time I am typing and it occurred to me the other day that I don't really know what anybody's handwriting looks like, which is weird because when I was a kid, you really knew what everybody's handwriting was like. And now I like think about people, I'm like, I don't know, I have no idea. I mean, I still handwrite a lot of my notes, but I think that handwritten letter to somebody in a guest book like hey sarah great job nice work on the show i think people still do respond to that and i'll tell you guys the guest books that i have had in my past exhibitions i still have them like i never threw them out because they're like really nice relics <laughs> of your exhibition so that's just a really nice little thing that i've always enjoyed that is a really nice part of the gallery show <laughs> this is funny. Darwin says, once I went to a reception and all they had was candy and nobody was there. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> so Karen is saying, would you suggest some virtual food? Ah, you read my mind, Karen. We're going to get to that really, really soon. Yeah, like this is such a great statement. 10,000 Crows says good snacks are the cure to social awkwardness. Yeah, because, you know, you can just like look down and eat your shrimp. So <laughs> it's like a lot easier. Obviously, people in the gallery looking at the artwork. Okay, so what I would do, if you are going to do it on Instagram, before you do a show, regardless of whether you're the teacher and it's your Instagram or maybe it's an artist association and it's a collective Instagram, whatever you guys want to do, you got to update it. You have to do like a sweep and make sure that the Instagram feels active or you might even do like a 
cleanse. I've done that on a couple of occasions where I look back on the Instagram, I'm like, eh, this post wasn't really fitting with what I'm doing. And so oftentimes I'll just archive the post just so you have your Instagram looks a little bit cleaner because I actually worked with an artist association a few weeks ago and I told them, listen, your Instagram's all over the place. Like your branding is not consistent. You've got all these different fonts and it's just really, really confusing. So I said to them, look, get rid of these posts because you're gonna have a much cleaner Instagram. So it never hurts to do this. I mean, even if it wasn't COVID, you still would not hurt for you to do a sweep of your Instagram. Okay, the other option you can do, and I know a lot of students did this for their thesis exhibitions in the spring, was create an Instagram just for the online show. And sometimes that's nice because then it's separate. It's like its own entity that is not a part of another Instagram. But I think the only issue is that if you start a new Instagram, you got to get everybody to follow you again. And the thing is on your own Instagram, you already have that built-in audience. So that's the one thing that makes me sort of hesitate about doing this. And then you think, well, okay, what happens when the show is over? Does that Instagram just die? So I actually think in my opinion, it'd be better to do it on someone else's Instagram, but I know some people don't want to merge worlds. So it's like whatever you guys want to do. Okay. So give the exhibition a title. And the thing is, I see exhibitions all the time that have titles like this, KSA Fall 2020 Member Show. And if you guys scan anybody's artist resume, you'll see stuff like this. And seriously, when I see a title like that, I just go, oh, like, it, it just doesn't sound interesting. Like, tell me, you guys, does this seem like an appealing show? Like, does this make you want to see the show KSA Fall 2020 member show. That does not make me feel that I actually want to go see that. So I think the exhibition really should be something beyond that. Versus, let's say you call it Artist Whispers. Yes, I know it's a dumb name, but I couldn't think of anything else. So between the two, which one would you rather have? First of all, the first one is really long and very impersonal and really sterile. The second one is much shorter and it's distinctive. It doesn't sound like every other show that you see out there. Oh, I really like this. Tiago says, I play a little concert with my harp in some exhibitions for a friend. This, that's another thing too, is I actually, when I was at Wellesley College, I used to get students from the music department and they would come and they would play music during the opening. Awesome. I mean, not everybody can do that necessarily, but I mean, you can get like live musicians. And even if you can't get live musicians, I always had speakers where I would like go and play something and, you know, just some regular music and it was totally fine. Just want to give a shout out to 10,000 Crows. Thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate your support. As you guys know, we rely entirely on donations and all of our content is 100% free. So here's a comment from Zoe. They're saying, I submitted a photo to a gallery, it was accepted. Awesome. But it's being held through the gallery's website and social media due to the pandemic. I'm glad galleries have find new ways to showcase work. Yeah, again, it will never be as good as in person, but people are finding ways around it. In any compromised situation, that I think is really definitely the way to go. This is a really interesting comment. I really like this one from Karen who is saying the first title sounds desperate. It, it's not a very positive <laughs> sounding title. And so I don't think I would do that. Emily is saying, what do you think about the future of online exhibitions is, especially with technology like VR becoming more and more accessible for the average person? I mean, the sky's the limit. You guys, it's like, you guys ever watch these sci-fi movies that are really old? And it's like an 80s version of sci-fi tech. Like if you've seen that Total Recall movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's this thing where he's like having a Skype call, but he's like holding this like landline phone. It's just like hysterical. But Emily, I would imagine at some point if they can put VR into a smartphone and make it as accessible as photos, as videos are now, that is when it's going to be a game changer. Because right now VR is not that accessible. The equipment's expensive. Not a lot of people know how to use it. So once it gets to that level of accessibility, I think that would definitely be a possibility. Okay. So 
If you decide to do it on Instagram, I think it's very important, and this is important in general for social media, switch up the type of images. Because this is what I see very, very often is people will have a slide and it's just the artwork. And social media doesn't work that way. I find oftentimes people try to treat social media like a website. So if you're on like my website, okay, you'll see my artwork and it's curated, it's cropped, it looks neat and formal and everything. And that's pretty much what all the photos on my website look like. Okay, maybe there's like one photo of me teaching, but that's it. Now on social media, that's not the case. On social media, if I just posted really perfectly cropped final versions of my artwork every day, nobody would follow me. <laughs> because the thing is, social media, you guys, it's about community. It's about engagement. And just seeing 20 photos in the row of finished artwork and nothing else, it gets boring really, really fast. So that is why it's so important that you guys switch up the type of images. We have a question from Kate. How do you recommend selling the work at the show? What commission would be held, if any? That really, really depends on the organization that's running it. Some galleries, I think, have a certain percentage that they take. I mean, in brick and mortar, the standard commission is 50% from a gallery. I honestly have no idea what people are doing right now for an online exhibition. I suspect there's something. It's possible that maybe it's a little bit lower. I have no idea. But yeah, you just would have to talk to the people who are running the show and find out. And so as far as how do you recommend selling it, you probably would have something that directs people to another site where they can get information. Now, again, that depends. Are you an independent artist? Are you an actual art gallery? Like if you're an independent artist, you probably wouldn't want to put the link of your shop into your bio in Instagram. So you could say something like shop in bio and then people could go there. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Okay. So Auntie M is saying, should gallery owners learn to use 3D scanners? Auntie M, are you asking about individual artworks or are you talking about the whole gallery? Because those are two very different situations. My guess is that it probably is not worth it. I mean, again, like the equipment's expensive. Not a lot of people know how to use it. And probably the results, I don't know. I mean, it depends on who's doing it. But I would guess for people like teachers, art associations, it's not really worth it. We do have another live stream tonight. Today's a double header. Tonight, me and Lauren are going to be doing a portfolio critique with Neil Espinoza, who I suspect some of you in the live chat have interacted with in the past. Okay, now I really think if, especially if you have a group show, like let's say it's a juried show for an artist association, show the faces. Tell people who are the artists. Because again, if you just have artwork on social media and you don't show anything else, it's like, how do you distinguish between this watercolor artist who paints, paints peaches and this watercolor artist who also paints peaches. It's the faces. You want to show that, especially um, if you're a college teacher and maybe you want to showcase the students. It gets a little bit dicier when you deal with high school because the kids are minors. And so you'd have to like get permission and stuff like that. So it's a little bit different depending on the age and the context of the artist. But if you can, it's adults and they are fine having pictures, show the faces. And I know a lot of people are very wary about showing their faces. Like a lot of people say, well, I don't like the way I look and I just don't, I feel very uncomfortable about that. But the thing is you guys, it's like if I see an online show and it's just artwork, I don't see anything else and I have no connection to it, I'm not really gonna care. But it's like, if you guys look at this picture, it's like, look at how awesome we are. <laughs> We're so cool. Like you totally engage with this in a personal level. That's different if you just see the artwork. And this is very specific to social media. If this is on a custom website, I probably wouldn't do this. But on social media, it's a lot better. Now, another thing you want to do, because most likely, if you do an online show, you're probably going to do a lot of posts, okay? Also, depending on the number of artists. Like, if you have 30 artists in the show, that's going to be a lot of posts. So you need to make sure that when you do those text captions, it can sort of feel like, oh, here's artist number two, here's artist number three. It's very easy to go on automatic pilot and just say, oh, let's just recycle the text captions. So we're just basically gonna say the same thing, but we're just gonna change a couple words here or there. 
what starts to happen, you guys, is people will start to notice, oh, this caption says the same thing as the last one. They're not going to read it anymore and they're not going to pay attention. So resist the temptation to do that because really what works a lot better is a personal one that feels like it was written by a person and not just by a bot or something like that. Also, it's really helpful to have a hashtag for the exhibition. And it's similar to the title of the show. So if you have KS Artist 2020, again, that just feels very descriptive. I mean, yes, it's accurate, but it's not that fun. So for example, if you say KS Artist 2020 show, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just like really, really boring. Artist Whispers, that's a cool hashtag. And that is one that people will notice because if you go on Instagram and you look at the tags that people use, once they start doing things like hashtag art, hashtag painter, hashtag watercolor, it just, uh, it's so generic. So something like artist whispers, that is the title of the show, that is the hashtag. And so if everybody uses that, on top of that being more distinctive, the artists can communicate with each other. So if everybody uses that, you can just tap on that hashtag and see all the other artists. Because the thing that's nice about an online show, especially a group show, not only would the gallery post the show, but then I'm going to assume that the artists in the show are going to repost, they're going to share. And so let's say you have 30 artists, they all use hashtag artist whispers, you can find each other way, way faster. Otherwise, all the artists are fragmented, and then you lose that sense of community. Okay, for this online show, you're going to need a lot <laughs> of photos. Now, this is where it becomes much more work because it's work if you want to make this really a good experience for everybody. But this really is the key, I think, to an online show, because if you don't have enough photos or if you only have photos of the finished artwork, it's dead in the water. OK, so you really have to like be on a campaign to shoot photos just for the show. And that's very different than what I think a lot of people are accustomed to, because usually in a show, they'll say, OK, submit six to ten images and give me your artist statement. And that's fine for brick and mortar when you actually will see people in person, but you won't do that virtually. So you have to have lots and lots of photos. So this is what I would recommend. I mean, obviously you guys can do it any way you want, but if you're an exhibiting artist and you're in a group show, you could have like a shared Google Drive folder. And so you could say to people, okay, upload these images to this Google Drive folder, and then you have it all in one place. And then what I always do is I put stuff in Google Drive and then I save it to my phone and then I post it to Instagram. So that's the quickest way to get the stuff in there. And let's say you could have a folder for each artist. So that way the artwork does not get super disorganized. I think it's fun to design a postcard. And honestly, I have not sent a hard copy postcard in years. Tell me in the chat, those of you guys who have exhibited in the past, When's the last time you mailed a hard copy exhibition postcard? Because, oh my goodness, for me, I think honestly, it was like eight years ago since I sent my last hard copy exhibition card because they're expensive to print and usually end up with so many extras. Like usually I'll use like, I don't know, 50. <laughs> but the thing is like, they always want you to print a lot because obviously it costs less the more that you print. But I stopped sending them because it's expensive. I had to keep track of the mailing addresses. I had to do stamps and it was a big pain. And this is terrible. I have a little confession, you guys. Whenever people give me their exhibition cards, I, I just put it in the recycle bin. Like I feel so bad saying that, but it's like, as far as keeping track of information, a hard copy postcard is harder because then I'm like, oh, I got to see. But if I get like an email invite to a show, it's in my email. I have the information. It's really easy for me to plug it into my calendar. For some reason, getting that information from a hard copy postcard into my calendar, it's just like that much harder. So I feel really bad because I know from an artist's point of view how much people really put time into printing these postcards and designing them and get, getting them out there. And then when I get them and I stick it in the recycle bin, I know it's so not nice, but it's like, that's my first reaction when I get a hard copy postcard now. It's like really, really bad. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Now what I would recommend 
is to make a carousel post on Instagram for each artist. So each artist sort of gets their own feature. And in a carousel post in Instagram, you can put up to 10 photos. And so that's really nice because you have an opportunity to really showcase the artist in a way that I think a lot of people would not think to do for sure. Builder D is saying, I picked up a postcard at a museum show and actually mailed it to someone else I know because of the picture, but that's my use for it, I guess. Well, I'm not saying that nobody does that. I'm just saying that for so much effort and cost for an exhibiting artist, it may not really be the best investment. And also a postcard in a museum is sort of different than it's like a personal artist that you know. It's a really different type of thing. Yeah, like Annie Williams is saying, I feel you. I'm so used to being paperless. And Blue Will Spirit says, do people collect them? I know ham operators send contact cards and people collect them. I'm sure there are people that collect them. Like Eloise Sherrod, one of our teaching artists here. I mean, she collects museum brochures and all these things for her collage practice. But I think that your average person probably doesn't do that. Okay, so carousel posts, it's like you have one image, you have a second image, you have a third image, so people just swipe through to see the images. And the important thing about the carousel posts is that they're related. Oftentimes I see people, they put together carousel posts and it's like, here's a monkey, here's an interior space, here are the mountains of Utah. You're like, what? Like, <laughs> so the carousel posts I think really have to be related to each other. C. Cantrell says, what about a postcard as a takeaway at a real life show, like a souvenir, when we can have them again. Absolutely, that's a different thing. That's like when you show up, there are these little postcard giveaways. Like I had a show once where the curator wrote an essay and they published this like little catalog. Like that's nice because it's different to go to a show, have the experience, take the postcard, as opposed to the postcard arrives in the mail and I'm going through my mail and I'm tossing out all this stuff. I mean, I'm sorry, that's where it goes. I feel really, really bad about that. Plague on Humanity says, what if you did a thanks for a donation to the exhibition with some stickers and artist business cards? You could, I mean, I think you could actually online if you wanted to do like a giveaway that might be kind of fun or, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can get stuff out there to people for sure. It's just, I guess what I'm thinking about is cost because a lot of people don't have tons of money to spend on stuff like that. So this, this is like the bare bones thing you can do with no money at all. Okay, so what I would do, let's say you have an exhibition and there's 30 artists, request from each artist a whole bunch of different types of photos, okay? So one thing you could request is say, take a photo of your studio view, okay? So, okay, you guys, who does not like looking at other artist studios? I love it, it's just the coolest thing. Tell me in the chat, when you guys see a photo, of an artist studio. Do you like it? Do you think it's fun? Or are you just like checking out other people's spaces? Is it a real estate experience for you? Whatever, just tell me, what's it like to see somebody's artist studio? And what does that do in terms of enriching your understanding of that artist? Also, I think this is going back to what a couple of people were saying earlier about the intimacy of a brick and mortar exhibition that is lost online. So one way you can do that is have photos of an artist's hands. Like when you zoom in, you show the material, you show the art, like you really feel like you're there. It feels very intimate and very personal. And I think that's the issue with a lot of online stuff is a lot of it does feel very impersonal. A lot of it feels very sterile and very detached. But it's like when you see a picture like this, don't you guys feel like you're understanding something about the artist that you wouldn't understand if you just saw the finished watercolor painting? Yeah, like, look at this. Everybody here is saying, I love studio photos. So Blue Will Spirit is, oops, sorry, I'm messing up my comments. Love looking at people's spaces. M. Vivar says, love it. It's so interesting to see their process and the messiness behind it. And Maryabel Asmar says, I like the studio photo. It's like seeing what goes on compare. Oh, okay. In my mind. Okay. I see. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I mean, people really like seeing this. Lunaire is saying, what about larger installation pieces, films, et cetera? How do you best put something like that in a carousel post 
or an Instagram preview, short reels or just photos. Okay, so let's say you have an animated piece and it's 10 minutes long. Obviously you cannot put that on Instagram. I think that probably what would be good is a really short video clip. So a video clip that's 10 seconds, you can put that into a carousel post. And so then you can direct people to the full video link, which is probably on Vimeo or YouTube or something like that. I mean, screenshots from films never really get me that excited because it's just sort of a bummer. Like it's just not as good <laughs> as seeing a real film. So I feel like I'd rather just see five second, six second, just quick video clip just to get me enticed. And then you can send me somewhere else to see that. But yeah, it's tricky. I mean, with artwork like that, it's always a compromise in terms of that. Yeah, like, look at this, like Margaret saying, I love seeing the studios. I feel that I learn a lot about that. And <laughs> Auntie Emma saying, does anyone else check what brand of paints they're using at the studio? Totally, I always do stuff like that. Like, I oh, I can't pronounce your name, sorry. Iosia is also saying they do the same thing. Okay, tools and materials. This is so similar in terms of the studio view, the hands, because you know, a lot of the times I'll look at artwork and number one, I wanna know what the media is. And I wanna know like, what kind of brushes do they have? Are they a messy painter? Are they a clean painter? And again, it's like you're inviting really an intimate personal look at the artist, which I oftentimes think really is lacking in a lot of studio situations. So show the tools. I think that is really fun. And then maybe like one or two photos of you actually in the studio. Like, this is awesome, you guys. Like, don't you feel looking at this photo of Alex that you know something about him as an artist? Like if you just saw Alex's paintings, and you saw nothing else about him, you would not form the connection you can when you get to see Alex's different hair colors. You know, it's like that personal intimate connection is very important. Okay, and then of course you definitely wanna have the finished artworks, maybe like four photos. And these are the ones that are like cropped, they're curated, they look really nice. So that's the thing, it's like if you just show the artwork and you don't show anything else, it does have a sterile look to it on Instagram. On Instagram, okay? If this is on a website, it's a completely different context, different use for the site. So it's a, not the same thing at all. Okay, I do recommend you guys for the artist statement, I really think it would be better to make it as an image in the carousel post instead of put it in the text caption. Because here's the thing, you guys ever do this? <laughs> Tell me if you do this, this is another confession. When I look at a text caption and it says artist statement and it's like a chunk of text, I don't read it. I'm like, oh, I don't wanna read this. But the thing is, if you're swiping through the carousel post and all of a sudden you come to an image like this and it's a picture of the words, I sort of wanna read it more as opposed to when it's in the text caption, it's a strange thing but I really think that this works. And so do something like this, but you gotta keep it short. Like if you have an R statement that's eight paragraphs long, nobody's gonna read it. So I would say like one paragraph, two paragraphs, and they have to be short ones, <laughs> you know, not like really long ones, I think would be a lot better. Now, if you have a juror, you definitely wanna have a carousel post that's about the juror. Like people wanna know, okay, who is the juror? What do they do? Are they a curator? Are they a professional artist? And sometimes, jurors will write a statement. Like I've juried shows before where I've written a little bit about the process. What was I thinking? What was I impressed by with the show? And so having a statement is good. And if you have a curator who you think would be good on video, maybe they do the statement in 30 seconds and they just say something in a video and you put it into the carousel post. So the juror I think does need to be featured because that is pretty important as far as those juried shows go. And then of course, a photo of the juror, very important as well. Okay, so what I would recommend in the text caption for each artist, okay, when you show the artist feature, in the text caption, write a personal message from the artist. Now, again, this is work because you have to ask everybody to write it. You got to get them to send it to you on time. It's work for sure, okay? Two to three sentences. You wanna tag the artists if they're on Instagram and then add some hashtags, keep it short. People don't like reading novels on Instagram. 
Like Tiago is saying, I'm doing short videos of my art process as part of my routine in Instagram stories. I think that's fabulous. And by the way, you guys, Tiago, we did critique their sculpture a couple weeks back. So if you guys want to look for it, it is in our YouTube channel and oh, beautiful polymer clay sculptures. Check it out, an amazing process. So yeah, Instagram stories, I'm not going to cover that today, but that's another outlet for showing more that like casual, intimate look. Lunaire is saying, artist statements are always the most difficult part for me. It's so difficult to keep it short. Oh, you and the rest of the world in terms of artists, we all hate writing them. It's like, please don't do this to me. Like I, there's a reason I'm not a writer. So they're hard for everybody for sure. It's not just you. Okay, so here's the part that might feel a little fake and silly when you're doing it, but I am convinced it will work, okay? Ask the exhibiting artist to shoot, quote, staged photos. So here's what I mean, okay? Here at the bottom, this is a photo from a real gallery show that I had, brick and mortar gallery. Okay, and I always do this. Every single time I have a show, I take photos of the gallery with nobody in it. I take photos at the reception because I want to have a record of that. So here's the thing, you don't have the brick and mortar gallery anymore, hang the artwork on the wall at your home and take a close up view so it looks like it's in a gallery, okay? You, you fake it, you make it look like it's there. Because you know what, to me, this is better than cutting and pasting somebody's painting and putting it into a Photoshop picture of a gallery. Because here you have like real shadows, you can set up the lighting. Most people will have some like neutral colored wall somewhere in their house where they can do that. So you stage the photo. And again, you're gonna feel fake doing that. But the thing is, nobody knows. It's like, what's the difference between this photo and this photo? Okay, like, like they're the same. Like, like in terms of the photo, you get the same result in a way. You can also stage this photo. Hang up the artwork on the wall, stand in front of the artwork as if you were at the exhibition. Now, again, this is a show that Lauren was in. I did not see it. I got to see this photo and it made me feel like I got to see the show. This is another silly thing, but really this would be cool, you guys. Come on, I would love to see some people try this at some point, which is to stage a photo of people looking at the artwork. Because like this is a photo of a show that Lauren has. And so she's standing in front of the photo with her friend. But it's like maybe you could get some family members, people you live with, whoever, have them stand in front of your artwork and you can have them face away. So you're not using their faces if you're worried about that. And it's like you totally could stage this photo if you wanted to. And it would be OK if it doesn't look like a perfect gallery. I think it would really be fine. I really like this. Slepnir is saying, you fake it to make it. Yep. I mean, what's the difference, you guys? Tiago says, what about interviews with other artists and curators? Sure. I mean, you could ask the exhibiting artists. You could say, if you want to shoot a video of yourself, maybe saying a quick thing about your work and about the show, those would be great. You could put them in the carousel post. You could put them in the Instagram stories. I think what's tricky about this is like collecting all the photos, the tech, that's a lot of work, okay? That's tricky to do. And I sympathize because I did that for four years and I still do it here at Art Prof. <laughs> it's a ton of work to hunt down all that information. Okay, so here's what I would do. Stage your opening reception, like actually schedule it. Like say to everybody, the opening reception is this Friday at five. It's, it's like, that would be hysterical. That would be awesome. I think people would find it very charming, okay? So you have the reception, but you spread it out over several posts. Don't just do one post, okay? Because remember, there are multiple components to an art exhibition. Stage a photo, okay? Get some wine, get some bottled water, buy some flowers, stick them on your kitchen table, and stage a photo, okay? And on Instagram, you post this photo. You post a picture of the flowers with the wine. I mean, this is pretty. Like, this totally would be fine on Instagram. You know, who doesn't want to look at pictures of wine and flowers? At least I do. <laughs> Again, Karen, you had asked earlier, do you make the spread? Of course you do. <laughs> you just, you go buy some grapes, you get some brie, some cheese, some crackers, you put out a tablecloth on your kitchen table, you arrange the food like it's an exhibition and you take photos. Like who would know the difference? Okay, and so then you have a post, you say, welcome to our show. 
here's the food, snack on it. I mean, we joke here at Art Prof a lot of the times, like Blueville Spirit is always putting the chairs away after the stream and you always make us virtual popcorn, you know, like something like that would be like super fun to do. Oh, this is funny. Karen says, wigs dressing up boxes come out of the attic, please. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you have a post that literally is pictures of your reception food and you get to eat it yourself. You don't have to share it with anybody. <laughs> because remember, social media is about interaction. If you don't interact with your audience, you're dead in the water. So you can do things like, let's say you have that post of the brie and crackers and the wine and everything. You could say in that text caption, hey, we got cheese at our opening reception. What's your favorite cheese? And people can answer in the comments, that's engagement, okay? Even if it's like a silly question, like this, this is a silly question, but people like easy questions. They don't have to think that hard about. Like, I totally know what my favorite cheese is. It's probably Cambazola or Gouda or Gruyere. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of favorite cheeses. But the point is, ask easy questions. So that way people really can just reply very, very quickly. Okay. Now, the other thing you want to do is ongoing engagement during the show. So let's say your Instagram show is up for a month. You want to keep asking those questions. Red wine, white wine. Tell me in the chat. I bet you anything, all of you can answer this question without even thinking for a second. I am definitely white wine. I don't like red wine at all. I mean, I don't drink that much, but if I did, I would have to drink white wine for sure. Now this would be really cute, you guys. And this would take time, but I seriously think this would be adorable, okay? So you know, I talked earlier about the idea of a guest book and how nice and intimate and precious those feel. So have an Instagram post where you say to people, sign in quotations, our guest book with a comment below. Okay, so people will type into Instagram, oh, great job, looks awesome, or whatever they wanna say to support the artists. And then you can say to them, give them something to say. Say, tell us where you're from and how you heard about the show. And so this is really cool because then you can see, oh, this is Frank from, Pakistan and this is Sarah from Brazil. And it's just fun to see like, oh, all your friends from all walks of life are coming to see this show. And so this is what I would do. Again, this would take time, but take those comments that people posted on Instagram, take a hard copy sheet of paper and hand write them on a sheet of paper. I did this like 10 minutes before the stream. <laughs> and then take a photo of the handwritten comment and make an Instagram carousel post out of those photos. This honestly does not take a lot of time. I, I literally did this 10 minutes before the stream. So you have another one and you can use different markers and pens. And you guys ever noticed this? Tell me if you've seen this. In a guest book, oftentimes people don't just write. They'll like draw a little picture, like a little smiley face. Or you know what else is really funny? Like you always see people like this who like adhere to the lines in the guest book. And then people who are like a little bit funkier. And this would be, there's always somebody that does this. Like these people who like cannot write on the lines and they like make a big splash. Like I always find this so hilarious. And so just take those. And then the people that wrote them can look and go, whoa, my handwriting has changed. <laughs> like I think this would be such an adorable post for an online show. Because handwritten comments, they feel personal they feel warm. And so if you guys see a picture like this on Instagram, I know it's not brick and mortar, but this is cute. This is totally adorable, you guys. So yeah. Uh, Blueville Spirit says, please be careful with the online version of this. Online guest books are notorious for having vulnerabilities. Almost guarantee you'll be hacked. Oh, do you mean in terms of the picture or in terms of the text? Because I think as long as you tell people not to put their full name, like if you just write Linda, like don't write Linda Smith, you know, I think that would be fine. As long as it's like not any personal information, I think would be good. But thank you so much for, I can always rely on you for that. Blue spirit. I love it. Eleanor, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate your support. You guys make art prof what it is. Thank you so much. Yeah. Like Lunair here is saying, I love drawing in guest books. Yeah, isn't it fun? And seeing everybody's handwriting and the different colors, I think this would be a super cute post. So yeah, definitely consider that. 
Okay, guys. We also have this exhibition stream, how to start exhibiting your artwork. So if any of you guys are thinking about it, this would be a good stream to watch because we do go over the things you need, like an artist statement, photographs of your artwork, that type of thing, which is very important. Artcraft has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And I will be hanging out on the Discord in the post live streams channel. You guys can chill out with me there. In a few minutes, I'll be hanging out there. The invite link to our Discord is in the video description below. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters for supporting us, giving us what we need, the resources to keep Art Prof up and running. And thank you so much, you guys, for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.